for the invitation. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is, so this is less probably like this and a journal club, um, more of like a sort of like uh, putting it out there hypothesis of, of like, I think that might or might not work um, uh, given recent advances in large language models and other stuff in the ML that have been making their way through uh, biomedicine. And so <clears throat> basically like you can think of this as, as saying like, you know, what if we had like, one model to sort of like rule them all in, in, in biomedicine. One thing, one model that like, um, in, in a way it try, tries to ingest all the data types in, in biomedicine and it tries to reason over them. Um, <clears throat> would that model be like useful? Would that model be uh, find new things or would, would, or, you know, or, or, and what would be like the, um, the pros and cons of having one thing like a thing like this. Um, I think like, so biomedicine is a, a great, it's kind of like great synthesizer, right? Like if to get to this, I, I love this picture of like uh, cancer. It's like a very common common picture of, um, of uh, that, you, that you see like across like many papers that basically try to synthesize what do we know of, of cancer, what the pathways are, that are involved and like inhibitors that are, that are trying to target those pathways. And if you think about it, like to get to this uh, point of understanding of cancer, if you, you like really go from zero to one, <clears throat> you have to like, to synthesize a lot of information. Like you have like a lot of like biochemical assays that are, are, are done to like meticulously like see which proteins are interaction between what, what other proteins in, in cancer. You have like to, to get like histology images to actually characterize what what uh, what are the cancer cells are, 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 how they look like and how, how what genes are like driving those like morphological changes. You have to, you know, uh, there's like genomic data that you have to take into account to, to characterize what uh, oncogenes are the ones that are present? What are the, uh, the the commutations like you know the KRASs and so forth? How do they look the cells resist death? Like what pathways are involved? And there's like a lot of data that goes in, like the sequencing data, gene expression data, histopathological data, clinical data, uh, like patient data, and like trials, etc. So getting to this level of understanding is like basically grabbing all these disparate data sets, trying to reason over them as scientists and, and sort of like getting that picture. Um, and so, yeah, so basically it's, it's basically a piece mile. Like if you think about it, like if, if you were an artificial intelligence uh, uh, sort of like, you know, and would, would, we're trying to like synthesize all this, the, the, uh, the way the, the way that like you would think about it, like in terms of AI, like would we like to generate piece while piecemeal like models specialized for each piece and maybe like, you know, put them together, we stories, produce hypotheses, test and revise and then synthesize the, the knowledge. Um, and right now that we've been doing this in, in a sort of, uh, uh, you know, piece by piece manner, like we have like uh, uh, models that characterize uh, cancer subtypes based on their gene expression profiles. We have like um, uh, machine learning models that characterize how, like what genetic mutations actually produce, you know, what uh, sensitivities in, in, in cancer and like that. And, you know, that's another way to characterize that. And then that's, that's synthesis in general. Uh, and so that's that's sort of how it is. Like you know, and the, the question is here: like, can can instead of like doing this piecemeal wise, like doing have like doing like specialized models, can we have like one model which is like perhaps everything, like you know, a big sort of like large language model, uh, and like and and just uh, synthesizes all this together. Um, that you know, it's it's it seems crazy, but you know, then of course, like uh, if you would tell me that like large language models that were were sort of like trained on web crawl. Uh, uh, a few years back, I, I also might not believe you. So, you know, this this is kind of like a thing that I think is open. Um, this is, of course, uh, as, as I mentioned, it's inspired by uh, large language models. Uh, and uh, as, as you know, like large language models are like this, uh, you know, very simple models really, like the, that they're just like predicting like masks, they're, they're doing like mass to tokenize token prediction. Um, uh, and just, and there's like this huge models that basically, and they have been like scale and scale with like more and more data and more and more parameters. Um, and like now, I think now we're reaching a, a place where actually data is more important than parameters. So we have to like scale down the parameters and scale the data back data. But in general, like the language, large language models have, have like started like to see like, uh, you know, we like just scaling them has, has produced like some amazing capabilities. Like for example, like uh, just like GPT chat that Jake came, came up uh, uh, a few days ago or like yesterday or something, I can't remember. Um, and basically like they, they do like, you know, fantastic stuff. I, 
I've now been like using it at, at, at work. I think like lots of times instead of Google, I just like search uh, GPT and like give me like some, whenever you do like a some dumb programmatic answer and you, you need like a, 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 a stack of all kind of question, you can like just ask these models. Like G, GPT can you know, exploit buffer overflow. They can explain you like really complicated regular access. It's like, it's, it's amazing you can, what you can do with this like basic task of just, you know, mass tokenized prediction, scale it all the way up that's what you get, right? So you, you get all these emerging properties that no one would have predicted um, that, that you will be able to get. Um, as an aside, I think like, you know, whenever NLP has like, like has like advances like LLMs, um, uh, bio tends to also, also, also like have these uh, uh, short very purpose, these uh, tools in, for, for their own, you know, benefit. So probably like the, the, the first, the first case of, or, one of the first cases of, of this happening is then back in the 80s and the, in the 90s where like you have all these algorithms for an NLP that like do like a you know suffix or like a sparse peak tagging that have been repurposed for analyzing sequences there's this very the, the you know very famously um this uh, uh secondary structure prediction for rna actually can be done with like stochastic context free grammars which were at, at one point, like the state of the art in, in, in NLP. And, uh, you know, you <clears throat> in the right here, we have like HMMs, which of course are still being used and still are, are, are state of the art in many of these uh, tasks. They're, they're like, you know, protein sequence and DNA sequence tasks. Um, so of course, LMs are not like, a, are not a, an exception. We definitely have um, uh, <clears throat> examples of like LMs and by medicine. Uh, there's the uh, protein language models, which basically just do tokenize, again, like mass tokenized prediction on amino acids and try to uh, 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 do like ESM, for example, which is this is like on the left. Uh, they, in, they basically like uh, let you just uh, do zero shot prediction with like lots of tests and, uh, that they are very, very similar to what like the, the large language models in NLP are doing. There's a uh, there's another like like uh, flavor of languages like a gen and gen SLM that basically like you know, try to like uh, um, go to the DNA level and sort of like trying to translate to a protein to see like you know what what sensitivities in the codons themselves are, are, are being done and so you can do like lots of things like variant variant annotation and all that kind of stuff um, and there like in the here in the in the, top, in the bottom right corner we have a uh, the representation of like the the Converta, uh, uh, a small molecule language model, which is basically trained on a facsimile of like smile strings that are basically give you a, a distribution over uh, or language model over the uh, the over like small chemical space. And these things can already do like pretty amazing stuff. Uh, you know, ESM is is has been known to produce uh, 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 embeddings and. Uh, another and another stuff that you can actually use in downstream tasks. So one of these tasks can be do like, for example, like a structure prediction. It's the ESM fold that came out uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, basically, does this and uh, you know, I've here here in the right, I'm just showing this this uh, some work that like uh, Omrap uh, Soyomis and, and I did uh, a couple of weeks ago. They just to like to take a look at how ESM fold compares to. Alpha fold when like trying to like assess like variant uh, predi like effect prediction and you know to our surprise ESM fold in, in like clinically related genes actually does produce like better structures than alpha fold uh, and that that sort of like tells you that you know even though these language models are not being trained to structure they 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 carry structures in the, within their signals right um, and again like here in the bottom type uh, bottom right corner is is a way of like just seeing that you know variants that are uh, fall within um, that basically like ablates a the the SM the uh, the SM ESM likelihood score um, are more likely to be pathogenic and so that's that's kind of like a a a way of like measuring variant effect prediction that they, these models again can do without actually being trained for so they're already like they're being like super useful uh, for all these kinds of things uh, by the way like you know just feel free to interrupt me with questions uh, um, yeah, and, and so for for the small molecule space, uh, there's definitely like uh, you know there's uh, they they there's a similar more although like, uh, right now I think more limited uh, use for lang like language models. There's right now you can you can design new uh, new 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 drugs or design new small molecules that have like different different affinity predictions. This is a paper that actually was using uh, genetic algorithms on top of a, an LM 
to maximize some affinity prediction um, uh, on, on some molecules to just find drugs. And so these, these, these things are like generally useful as well in, in the small molecule space. Um, but if we think about it, we kind of like a step back. Uh, there is a, a thing like, you know, other than like scaling up and like the transformer architecture that like LMs use, there is one like uh, key ingredient to them. And, and basically it's, it's trying to see what, uh, it's trying to get like the minimal, like more, most informative task that you can solve in this case, mass token prediction. Uh, so that, that basically many, many tasks of, of uh, domain uh, <clears throat> map to that task. And so when you, you, you solve that, the, the, this basis task, as, as I, as I, I sort of call them, call them here, um, you, you kind of like have a domino effect and like solve, solve all the others. And so na again, natural language uh, that has like many tasks like question answering, sentiment analysis, uh, class, like sent sentence classification, et cetera, basically can be mapped to mask, mask token prediction in one way or another. Um, <clears throat> protein sequence modeling can be, can be like also masked to like structure prediction, variant effect, et cetera, can be also masked to, to uh, can be also mapped to masked uh, amino acid uh, uh, prediction. And vision, very <coughs> efficient uh, vision, like visual questioning, answering, captioning, bounding box, et cetera, uh, that can also be sort of like, in, in a way, um, um, uh, traduced, uh, translated to mask image patch prediction. Um, this is like uh, something that's been generalized. Uh, uh, this paper called Data to Vec by, uh, by, by Facebook. Uh, uh, and <laughs> where you can actually see that like, it's basically just masking some, some uh, part of the data, be it like images, speeches, or languages can yield you know, similar results. That, that seems to be like the basis task for many of these data types. Um, and there, there's another thing where, uh, you know, another like important thing, if we wanted to adapt like a, a big language model for, for biology, not only like you know taking a look at like what the basis task would be, but but also uh, trying to like um, uh, synthesize as many modes as possible. And so this is like this is a PIX, the Pix to Seek version two uh, a paper by 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 uh, uh, George Hinton and, and uh, et al. Um, and they basically what they do they they try translate or like uh, uh, ca they cast these uh, image like operations you can do like bound boxes uh, segmentation description captioning etc. By you know, which are basically tasks that that are like image plus some text. Uh, capture them with like one model, basically like uh, outputs outputs like either a text like a bounding box or uh, or a caption or something like that. And they and the, and the way this most mostly works is it it takes like both the input of a text uh, and in the image and and um, and and sort of like in, you know embeds them in different spaces uh, and, and encodes them. And, you know, it's it's actually pretty straightforward. Like you, you can actually uh, go go at great length, great lengths with like sequence friction. A similar a similar thing came came out uh, so recently. Also, like this unified I/O by uh, the Paul Allen Institute. Uh, they they have this uh, transformer and decoder, uh, uh, encoder and decoder architecture where they basically have, uh, you know, they 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 jam into uh, uh, one big embedding both the image and the and the language part. And then that is like uh, encoded and decoded uh, into both an image and an extent. So the output is an image and a text as well. So it, this this model that like uh, produced like both uh, supports like you know things like bounding box bounding box prediction, depth field prediction, but also uh, image generation from 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 both like combined with like image to image or like text to image or like text and image to image. So it's kind of like this unified uh, thing that like it can, can, can go like fully multimodal and, uh, and, and, and just like treat those things as, 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 as into, into a, one, the same. Model. Um, so by, I think biomedicine is, is kind of the multimodal and you have like, uh, you know, it's, it's not just like image and text, right? You actually have sequences, you have protein structures, you have uh, dose responses, you have like uh, genetic associations, you have, uh, you know, histo histobiological images, uh, chemical structures, gene matrix, uh, gene expression matrices, like the, the, the modalities are basically endless here. And, um, <clears throat> you know, if, if there's in any one domain where like think like multimodality multi will both be a boon and a challenge would be like, I think biomedicine. Um, 
so yeah, so the question is, can we learn a uh, all of bio into one model? Can we incorporate all the data modalities, figure out what bio's <clears throat> basis task is, put together this huge data set somehow, uh, train it and, and somehow like arrive to a problem. Like the 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 base, the, the kind of like the end point here is it's kind of, it's it's the one thing that it's open ended because uh, the, the the question is what would be a use case of, of such a model. But you know if you if say, say say that you know a, a use case for here could be like well in knowledge retrieval or inference would be like well what what genes you could ask the same model what genes are upregulated in Alzheimer's disease and like how toxic is this molecule that you've never seen. Uh, 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 how, what's the toxicity profile? How, like, does this protein, which you've never seen, interact with any other that 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 you know of? Or, uh, or like for design, you say, you know, basically give me a molecule that binds this target with low to low toxicity. Design this protein, this protein that glows more than GFP. Like all, all these like queries that 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 uh, you can think of. Um, if you have all these modalities merged into one model, it it should be possible to actually solve them. In even in a in a in a zero shot manner. So, <clears throat> so I think like bio's basis task um, could be you know the first proposal is like maybe the 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 basis task here is actually knowledge graph generation, um, which is you have like a knowledge graph uh, in in biology like everything really can be cast as a graph both like protein protein interaction maps for example, or um, like uh, causality relationship between uh, like genetic associations and diseases or those responses or, 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 so, or so forth. And so each node here is a particular entity like different like mode. Um, and each, each node actually has not only like what mode it is, but also uh, <clears throat> it's, it's, it comes from maybe another model that like actually embeds that particular like, uh, that particular like mode. For example, here in like, in, you would have like some, you have like ESM that like produce embeddings for a protein sequence. Uh, here for genetic associations, you would have some other some other embedding that like knows how to like embed genetic associations. So for you, so you might need actually like one model for like each modality. But then like the 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 knowledge graph is like this this uh, big thing that like uh, 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 collates all these nodes, and then like uh, you have like annotation for each of these of, of these edges, uh, and you know edges can be like experimentally theoretically like derived or something like that. something like that. And so the idea would be like um, if you think of as 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 a, as a graph as a prompt, so very, so you know it's, instead of prompting GPT three, you would prompt this model with a particular knowledge graph, saying like this this thing in purple here. Um, would can the language model or like the, this unified model actually produce a, like produce like saying like oh so there's like a molecule that I think like you know an all, uh, it could be like a new molecule or a new molecule that like binds to this protein and produces these effects and so forth. It's, it's kind of like Knowledge, so this knowledge generation completion can be uh, a, a a way to like get to these to, to this uh, to this unified model. Uh, you know how how would you train this thing, and it would depend a lot on, uh, uh, on 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 the data you have. But like in general, you can either train them by just using some GNN, uh, uh, and then you know actually like you you can actually. Uh, translate knowledge uh, uh, or graph generation or graph uh, inference into like mask uh, node or an edge prediction. And so that, that how, that's how you would do it. Or you can also do a random walk just by, by basically like traversing all these uh, edges and then like producing the sequences and then train, train, train a sequence model on that. Or you can also use like maybe a diffusion process like people have been, have been doing with, uh, with just generating graphs for small molecules. That, that, that could be like a, a way to go. Um, a, a single proposal that you know I, I sort of been thinking of like reading all these multi uh, uh tasks would be basically to have like this uh, support like a, a, a set of uh, different modalities for uh, for 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 data. So like again like uh, protein sequences, um, small molecules, gene expression, etc. Have a model decoder, and then like basically like uh, or actually this is a model encoder. Sorry. Uh, uh, had a model uh, all encoder that actually puts something in a combined input embedding, and that basically just like transforms the codes in the, in the same manner as uh, you know pix to seek and unified IO are doing, and they have like an output uh, output encoder, and like then have a modal decoder that both you know can be like diffusion based or something like that, like uh, 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 in, in in a way so that you can generate the uh, 
the multimodal like uh, outputs of it too, given the 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 inputs. Um, this is something that you know uh, that's this uh, general like especially this part of like decoding. Uh, I think like de decoding like uh, interesting uh, data types from a like a, a given embedding is actually something that's you know right now being like it's it's pretty hot right now. Like diffusion models are being used to do this sort of thing where. Uh, where you can actually like uh, you know this this just came out like we were discussing at the beginning the, by uh, generate AI like where they're uh, generate bio like they they have this have this chroma uh, model that basically can produce uh, 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 protein structures uh, but then condition uh, by something right you can condition by symmetry substructure shape semantics like using NLP descriptions like anything you can you can, you can think of so this conditioning. On other like data types or on other like uh, uh, yeah, so other data types like it's basically like a a, a way of like integrating all these like uh, uh, it's it's a way of producing this model decoder that basically like uh, integrates all these data types. So I think like we're we're sort of heading towards that in a way. Um, so how would you get data for this? And I think like uh, one thing that's a boon in in bio is that. There's just a lot of data, like highly curated data everywhere, and that's you know that's great. Um, in this, for this case, you know, getting relationships uh, between between things like protein sequences, diseases, etc., it's, it's kind of the bottleneck. Um, and but if you look at interactomes and generally like public level data, databases, they typically have around fifty to twenty percent, twenty x uh, the number of nodes. Um, and so the total relationships, total relationships are, are actually, if you actually look at Uniprot, for example, they have like two, 20, 20 hundred uh, million, uh, uh, 200 million uh, uh, sequences. And, you know, if you look at uh, gene, the gene expression oh, omnibus, they have like, like several, uh, almost, I think like almost 100,000 like data sets. Um, and if you sort of like take the, the inter interact with these things, the uh, data set actually comes up being a lot around you know two to five billion maybe uh, under that ballpark um, um, in size and so that in a way uh, you know you can expand this with uh, with other stuff but like in a way I think that might be sufficient to train like a, a really big model on this um, uh, you know to, to with like the the uh, lay on data set is, is around like five billion and that was used yeah that has been used to train like the uh, image generation. Uh, division models that you all know and love, and um, you know homology might hinder and expand this uh, or expand this. So it, homology like it can expand like uh, like relationships just by you know uh, doing like a guild by association kind of thing, where like a, a protein you don't know it's associated to a pro another protein you actually know and you know what it's doing, and so you think you're, they're doing the same thing. But it also can be a hindrance because uh, many things in biology look the same just because they're they're, they're homologous. You have to like take care of like how. To, on, on how do you do how do you train models on this? Um, another like interesting thing about, about this kind of like relationship data in biology, it's like it's sort of T shaped. Uh, so lots of data for some model organisms. So they kind of like top of the T. You have these model model organisms where they're like you know they have like wide data where like they're you know we, we know a lot of stuff of, of them. So um, we have like experimental integrated them and like data sets for them. Uh, and so you have like lots of edges between lots of modes. And then you have like a, a sort of like a sort of like an iceberg. You have like a very like long tail in like the, the bottom of the T where like normal organisms are basically just, you know, sometimes you you have like the genome sequences, that's it. And you only have like mostly homology relationships back to the um, back to the mole organisms. And that's how you kind of connect them. Um, sometimes you, do, you don't even have a genome, which is which is bad. Yeah. So so basically like the, the uh, sort of taking care of like this gene training, like, like you would have to like uh, have like a smart way of like, uh, of, of doing this in training. Um, you can do like data augmentation through th either theory, like, you know, they're basically generating databases for, uh, th that's, a, that's a one way of, in, into this model, like integrating like all, all, of, all the theory we know, just like generating like a DFT, like uh, calculate my, my property, for example, uh, or, or looking at databases of such, like through homology or in practice simulations. And that's, that's a way you can you further augment the data. Um, you know, uh, why why a unified model and this is something that i've been sort of like thinking uh, uh or like the the, the crooks of of uh having this i i think like right now it, you know it sounds it's sort of, it's sort of like if you think uh before 
having created like something like GPT, um, why would you create like a large language model, right? Like if they, people would not have predicted like all these like zero shot uh, capabilities. So maybe there's something there that like maybe there's, maybe have adding all these modalities together uh, eventually does produce like uh, interesting emergent properties, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's basically just like a, a very, a very like risk hypothesis, but also like there's, there's like centralized development. Uh, so if you look at what Lion, for example, has done for computer vision, uh, they basically, they, you know, they, they are all now focused on, 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 on building this like pillar data sets that, uh, that are like important for computer vision and therefore for image generation. Um, and, uh, and that, that kind of like, they, they basically have become like these rallying cries of, of like, uh, centralized resources that like, it's, it's a way to better organize research directions and like research efforts. Um, the data, like data itself becomes the model, like that, you know, the model training, of course, it's, it's expensive, but, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not as important as, as, as the data and like having like highly, like it's, it's this like beneficial, uh, sort of like uh, virtuous so, uh, uh, cycle where the better data you have, the better model you have. So uh, you have to both like uh, curate the data as, 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 as best as possible. And that's that's always good for the community in general. You would never have to do like any more blue scripts. So I don't know about like anyone here in, in, in bioinformatics, but uh, but generally bioinformatics is like 90% just blue scripts uh, on across like, you know, multiple models, like specialized models. So if you want to know for example, if like the protein you generate with chroma is like interacts with another protein, well, you have to actually like, look at protein databases and homology searches and all kind of stuff. So that that, that should be easy to throw. Um, uh, let's see if we have time. Um, yeah, so that's 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 basically it. Like that, you know, it's it's a it's a very simple idea. I just I just sort of put it in the world. I was kind of like interested to see that many people were 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 interested in, in, in such thing, and I would love to hear anyone's thoughts on this and generally like you know looking for um what will be like a, a way like if this sounds interesting enough or, or, or it has like a huge use cases is there a way like you like one could maybe make it happen or or um or you know maybe this is like not a dumb idea so i'd like it's I'm, i would be happy to 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 take questions here Uh, oh, I think it says ask to unmute. I'm sorry, is anyone asking to unmute? Yeah, I think William is, but... Uh... Uh, William. Yes, hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, great. So, uh, thanks uh, very much for uh, the talk, uh, for the research you've done, and uh, trying to expand on the initial idea. Uh, honestly, I, I feel this is, uh, I, I was saying uh, for some time now, I think this is the future of biology. For me, the most important question is, uh, how do we start? I feel this is really a, a, a problem. Obviously, we can't uh, have a 100% uh, uh, can't be 100% sure that it will work, but uh, I feel it's definitely 100% worth uh, trying to work it out. So yeah, this is my question. Uh, I would very much uh, want to see this happen and yeah, potentially participate on that. Yeah, uh, so I think it's, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's a good question. Like how, how would you make this happen? Um, so the first, uh, first and foremost, you would have to uh, create like a data a data set for this. Um, it shouldn't be too hard, but it should be just laborious. Like there's every every so so uh, so and forth year, there's like this uh, people that like there's there's efforts of like basically. Uh, so this this for example, this this image came from a paper from uh, Netredex, which is uh, a database of databases, which are basically you know compiles databases in biomedicine, like does this. Um, systems biology analysis gets like a graph on them. And so, <clears throat> but having like, having a, a gold standard data set that like, you know, combines drug bank, Uniprod, like all, all these like data, like data sets and then uh, and curates them in a, in, a, in a way would be, even even the project fails, it might be like a, a good, uh, uh, sort of a good deliverable. Um, 
So that's that would be like how you would start. So first form, how to like compiling all these data sets into one unified framework, and then uh, uh, and then like basically go to town on training. Yeah. Uh, also, maybe as a follow-up question, which of the two proposals would you feel would be the better approach? The one with the graph network or the uh, other with the common embedding model, uh, as you say, yeah, model? Honestly, I don't know. I think I would I would try. So for this this proposal, for example, this one has it's already like shown promising, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of like it's shown uh, promise uh, in other domains, uh, like text with like images. Uh, so and and uh, and in a way, like the, the, the chroma thing is, is sort of like like this. Uh, so you know you could you could start this with like a limited set of modalities, say uh, uh, protein sequences, uh, small molecules, and um, uh, and and like you know either like text or something, right? So like you know, three modalities, and then try to see if you can if you can what, what you can do take away from it. Um, my guess is that as you get more, like have more and more modalities, like you want to embed images, you want to embed like gene expression matrices, you want to embed like gene associations, this thing might be might get a little bit too un unwieldy in terms of like the input embedding, uh, and uh, that might you know, make things like like super difficult. Um, at the same time, like so, I I like the idea of like uh, network generation, but um, it's it's also sort of like uh, you know there's there's not a lot of work on on network generation. And so that 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 is like another like open frontier. Um, so I would start with the, the first. I would start with proposal number two actually, and then like maybe try proposal number one after. Uh, yeah, let's see if Cesar, Cesar can. Hello, Sergio. Thank you so much for the wonderful perspective. I have a question. How would this model be superior over taking, let's say, n com? compartmentalized models that would just attack each task sim uh, simul not simultaneously, but uh, specifically. And I would say, or, or what I was thinking was that the querying potential is of course the most interesting thing. You will be able to find out associations between components that maybe you wouldn't have been associated before if you took these tasks individually. But do you think that would somehow find a way those, those associations, those relationships would find a way to go back into the model somehow to to try and make it learn new dependencies. Yeah, no, that's that's a big question with like with large language models, and that generally is their Achilles heel, right? Like, um, so one thing you can you you can do is is have like these reinforcement learning kind of like uh, 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 sort of feedback uh, with the humans in the loop to 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 kind of kind of fine tune it as it goes. So sort of what do we do with like. Uh, with this uh, instruct GPT and all these other things, where like you can you can guide the model as, as you have like new um, new like you have new data, but generally like incorporating like more and more knowledge is something that because you have like trained model like not from scratch but at least in, in a way in a way like from from like uh, uh, midpoints, and so that that is like the accuracy of LMs. Uh, so for example, like GPT, right? Like I have to train it like every every year because. Uh, it's not something you can re-index the internet on. It's, it's 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 more difficult. So that's, I think that's the second question. Like the first question was like, how is it superior to like uh, more individual models? I think I, I, on honesty, I would be surprised if this would be superior to to other models. I I'm not sure though. Uh, so at first, for example, I was I was sort of like thinking when like ESM folds came into the into into being. Where is this? where is the ESM fold? Oh, here's yeah. So where where ESM fold came to being, I was like, well, there's no way this can be better than AlphaFold, right? Like, and, and um, because AlphaFold is just, just like really like tuned to be like structure, and like ESM is actually like unsupervised, self supervised. Uh, but it turns out like for this back gene, back three gene, which is chaperone, that's like super important. Uh, AlphaFold actually sucks, and and then like uh, ESM fold actually doesn't. So there might be some corner cases where like having another modality of data. Having like some self supervision trick here um, improves over like the single mo like single specialized niche model because like it that's blind to other other kind of data. Uh, yeah, so that's that that would be like my, my my guess. That's that's a great answer. And would you think there would be a way to sort of weight these different contributions within the model? Let's say if I have one that has more signal, I could probably use that as a 
as my designated output for one prediction in particular, and then just weight that for those classes of predictions, let's say, and have have a yeah, for sure. context aware so, model. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that this has been done. I think like pixel pixel seek could be too actually as a waiting uh, also like uh, uh, heuristic for for some prompts, um, <clears throat> even for training themselves. Like uh, train like tra training like really large scale models. Like now, there's a proposal of like training like uh, with like sparse like so called sparse models that are basically a mixture of experts. And so you you're training like experts like in like in a distributed fashion. And each each expert is sort of like tries to like eventually like uh, converges into like a, a specific like set of tasks uh, of, 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 like, of the model. Like, uh, and then in the end, like you, you can sort of like turn them on and off to, to see how like, sort of like uh, you know, dial them up. up, up. Uh, so the, it, it's not only like good for training because you, that allows you to train like much larger models with like less, lar less compute, but it's also a way to just like uh, compartmentalize the knowledge of, of the, that the model is actually digesting. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I told you, I'd say training, 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 uh, weighing uh, mechanisms are would be like uh, beneficial for this. Very insightful. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Uh, great. So, A eighty eight. Hi, uh, I really liked your presentation, and I was just wondering, since like the data set itself that you'd be training on is going to be so vast, and the diversity inside the data set is also going to be pretty, uh, pretty large. I was wondering if you're uh, if you were worried about diluting certain information within the data set, specifically those that would be like underrepresented. And also, there's kind of like the question I have with regards to because there's so much data and there's so much different types of data. Aren't you worried that some of this data is just going to be kind of like a layer of noise almost on the meaningful information? Yeah, so I I think that's an excellent question, and I I do expect both to be like challenges. Uh, <clears throat> so on the first end. Um, you would of course like have to like have like a uh, when you train you would have to like have a sampling of uh, if people do actually do this like in, in language in language uh, large language models they have like a high quality data set or like several high quality data sets and like large larger data sets that are like super low quality and they actually like sample like weigh them differently and they they they, sa they sample during training like in different ways so that the unrep unrepresented but high quality data is more uh, get surfaced more during training. Uh, so that so you you would definitely have to do that, uh, but I think there are methods that that now kind of allow you to do that. In in terms of like what modalities bring noise and what not, I think that's yeah that's a, a definitely great question, and that's that's where I don't think we have any more any like any uh, sort of like previous previous art on it. To be honest, like no one right like no one has tried to to train like a vastly multi-model uh, model in a way that. Some modalities might be like super noisy or like even irrelevant, and uh, and I think I think during training you would see that like if you like get rid of a modality, then suddenly like the 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 model just like you know uh, gets better, then that means that modality like is just adding noise or something. So it's kind of yeah, you 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 would you would definitely have to uh, take that into account. But I think there's previous art for one part, of it, not previous art for the other. Yeah, and. Um... I think that makes sense. And like the other question I have is, what do you think about just using, um, I guess, like an ensemble of different models that are specialists for their specific type of input data, and after just feeding the embeddings into some other model? Yeah, that's that's. I, I think in a, in a way, uh, that's what you would you would do. Like if you for each of these things. Uh, so in this case, for for example, here each each of these nodes would come from different models. Uh, I don't. For example, I don't, I don't expect, uh, or I would not want to like train, train from like, uh, you know, having this, this node here be a smiles, uh, just like a standard smile representation, uh, or like having this be like just a amino you know, acid sequence. It would be better if you have like an ESM fold embedding and uh, convert to embedding here uh, instead of like having like to train from scratch, um, because I don't think you like training from, from scratch would be like probably like not even beneficial. You would like waste a lot of compute. You know, re recapitulating ESM and recapitulating converter. converter. Uh, so you don't. I don't think you would need that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. No, thank you. Yeah. I think there is a in the chat. I see. Oh yeah. So what do you think about embedding molecules using their chemical composition only DNA RNA proteins uh, proteins down to small molecule? Uh, 
so this is <clears throat> i'm guessing this mean uh just grabbing onto so if you want to train for example an esm model not doing not doing it with uh via like amino acid prediction but doing it like on the whole structure itself like the whole atoms themselves um i think this this could definitely be possible uh i <clears throat> the one thing i would worry is that if you try to combine DNA, RNA, and proteins and small molecules into one, uh, one model, um, and maybe you have to like you know take 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 into account like how how big each of these data sets are. For for example, there's like vastly more uh, protein structure data uh, than um, you know RNA structure data uh, or DNA structure data. So you would have to. I think it's it's the same thing, like the same challenge as, as training with like you know using like a multimodal approach you you have to like somehow either augment the dna rna parts uh or or sort of like uh, uh sampling sample them uh smartly during training uh that's that's probably what we're... oh yeah Nicolo. Uh, hey, uh, first of all, uh, fun, absolutely fantastic presentation. Uh, I, I really, really uh, appreciate that uh, you joined us uh, today because I feel like in general, this is, in my view, one of the most uh, interesting di directions in general uh, with the hope of hopefully developing uh, more general and more uh, uh, f foundation models, let's say. Uh, I can say that um, my own point of view is that there is still going to be a significant amount of data that is uh, in a single modality only. And so the possibility, the best way forward could be the uh, uh, to leverage multimodal uh, techniques based on pre-trained uh, single modality uh, techniques or models. Uh, I've seen some based on aligning uh, um, latent um, spaces in models in, uh, in different modalities uh, as a follow-up step. I, I think that could be extremely interesting. And in general, I, I feel like this is the kind of work that the community will be particularly up for, especially because uh, the, the, the data work as well will be, in my view, extremely valuable to the wider community. We have many friends in communities like Lion who have significant expertise uh, in multimodal techniques and in the creation of, of those large data sets. And we are also, for example, we have a project dedicated to biochemical language models. And so we can also and plan to train uh, such models in the same very same community. So yeah, if people are interested, I think having a project in this area would be absolutely amazing. And importantly, we have the compute and also the storage, which can be extremely important for data heavy uh, project to make it happen. So yeah, that's all. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, be, um, I'd be stoked to, to, to sorry, so as you say, like maybe like even even just having the data sets, uh, in one place, and that that it's already like a big win, um, uh, to, for for like the community in general. All right. Um, any any other questions from anyone? Okay, I think uh, then uh, this should be all. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, seriously, for uh, this talk. I think uh, many, oh, uh, yeah, I think A88 uh, has uh, uh, something to mention. Oh, after the recording is done, okay. Um, yeah, awesome, awesome, absolutely awesome talk. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I will stop the recording now then so that uh, we can hear the uh, A's uh, question. Yep.